It's now my pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker, Dr. Connie Mariano. Dr. Mariano is used to breaking barriers, used to shattering the glass ceiling. Born to a Navy steward and his dentist wife in the Philippines, Dr. Mariano lived the life of a family in the American Armed Forces. Her life has been filled with many achievements. She was the valedictorian in her high school class, graduated with honors from the University of California, San Diego, earned a medical degree from the Uniformed Services University School of Medicine, and has a distinguished 24-year career in the U.S. Navy. Dr. Mariano also has been the first in the following achievements. The first military woman to become the White House physician to the President of the United States. The first woman director of the White House Medical Unit. And the first Filipino American in U.S. history to become a Navy Rear Admiral. After leaving the White House in 2001, following nine years of service to three sitting American presidents, Dr. Mariano joined the Mayo Clinic here in Scottsdale, and a few years later founded the Center for Executive Medicine, a medical concierge practice which provides presidential quality medical care to CEOs and their families. We are excited to have her with us to deliver some remarks. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Mariano to the stage. Good afternoon, graduates, parents, family, friends, and distinguished faculty. I am so honored to be your speaker today. I'm happy to be back in this arena once more. I sat in these bleachers on three separate occasions to cheer on my sons as they got on stage to receive their baccalaureates and master's degrees from ASU. So I'm proud to say today that we are a Sun Devil family. Thank you, ASU. <laughs> Graduates, today is all about you. Your class represents professionals from all the health sciences. Just think of it. If an emergency were to happen today here in this arena, and somebody would yell, is there a healthcare professional in the house? You all would stand up and respond, right? So you've worked really hard to see this day happen, but you know you wouldn't be here without the help of a lot of other people. So today, remember to thank everyone who helped you get here today. Thank your professors, teaching assistants, administrators. Thank your parents and your family. Thank your friends. To the mom and dads here, first of all, Happy Mother's Day on Sunday for you moms out there. Congratulations to mom and dad. You know, today is your day too. You have the right to be proud of your son or daughter as they receive their degree. Now you're eager to see them get a job, make a living, and hopefully, hopefully make that important step towards freeing them from the bank of mom and dad. Although my adult children tell me that the bank of mom and dad never really closes. <laughs> when I was invited to be your guest speaker day, I was very excited. I was also instructed to make my remarks brief. As I prepared for today's keynote, I reverted to my old college undergraduate days and my medical school behaviors when it came to facing a deadline. I procrastinated. I waited till last night to write my final remarks, and as the day approached, I sat at Starbucks discussing various ideas for what I would say with strangers who were having coffee there. As, it, as I got closer to this day, I engaged in more frantic activity, and then, of course, I pulled that infamous all-nighter, writing late into the night. Of course, this has never happened to you, right? Never happened. Most important of all, I sought professional help. I asked my kids, 
My youngest son gave me the best advice about commencement speeches. He told me this, Mom, don't worry about what you say. It really doesn't matter. <laughs> no one ever remembers the commencement speaker unless, of course, you are really, really, really bad. Not his exact words. So today my goals are simple. First, honor you, the graduates on your achievement. Second, share some words of wisdom. And third, do the above in 15 minutes or less. And of course, the fourth is not be really, really bad. So this month, I celebrate a professional anniversary. In two weeks will be my 38 years that I've had the initials MD after my name. Since the day of my medical school graduation, I have seen healthcare evolve not only in scientific discovery and advances, but in the delivery of health care. So the education you're receiving at ASU reflects the advances in healthcare has made over all those years. You're entering the healthcare profession with the best education training available. That's going to make you very competitive in the marketplace. Many opportunities are going to await you. So what's next for you? Where do you plan to go after this, after your graduation? Inevitably, you will go on to the first of many job interviews. How do you proceed? How do you succeed? Well, let me share a true story about an interview that changed my life. And I'm going to try to do this in 18 minutes or less. So let me tell you this story. In 1991, I was living in San Diego, California. I was in the Navy. I was married to my first husband, which is a whole different story. Um, <laughs> We have uh, our two sons were one and three, and uh, we lived in a lovely house three doors down from my parents, and I was division head for internal medicine at one of the largest teaching hospitals in the Navy. And on the surface, you would think life would be great. I had a wonderful job, great career, but somehow something felt missing, and I couldn't put my finger on it. But just somehow I thought, is this the way it's going to be? And it so happened at that time, my 10-year commitment was almost over in the military, and I had to come up with a big decision, again, on a threshold of a decision, what to do. My 10-year commitment was up, coming up, and I had to decide whether I wanted to stay in the Navy and make it a career or get out and go into civilian practice. And I was really wrestling with that. My husband said, listen, my law firm is going to Palm Springs for a retreat this weekend. Let's leave the kids with your parents and let's go to Palm Springs and you make your decision in the desert. I said, good idea. So we go off to Palm Springs, and I remember that day I was trying to relax and meditate and calm down. And then that evening they had the traditional attorney cocktail party, and I walked down into the grand ballroom with my husband. He goes off and joins the law partners, who at that time were all male, and I find the wives of the law partners. And I finally found them. And what struck me was they were tan, they were rested, they were talking about Pilates, yoga, you know, they had time for shopping, lunch, and they looked, you know, they weren't frazzled like me, working long hours, taking care of family, students, things like that. So I made a decision. So I pulled my husband aside. I said, you know what? I think I know what I want to do. I have, I have an epiphany. He says, what do you want to do? I said, well, I'll get out of the Navy. You become law partner, and I will become a trophy wife. <laughs> I really want to be a trophy wife after seeing them. He says, okay. So we had a wonderful weekend. Monday morning, I'm back at the Navy Hospital in San Diego. I go down to the Office of Personnel. I ask for the papers for release from active duty because if you want to leave the military, you can't just say, bye-bye, I quit. Nope, you fill out your paperwork in triplicate. They forward it to the people in Washington, D.C., and then you are allowed to leave nine months later. So I'm filling out the paperwork on my desk, and it dawns on me that I am really leaving the military. I've known all my life as a military brat and the military medical corps. And so that's what it takes. I'm filling it out. So as I'm filling out my paperwork, my phone rings, and it's the chairman of medicine, my boss, the captain. And he doesn't know I'm trying to leave. And he says, Connie, I just received the message traffic from Washington, D.C., and I'm to nominate five candidates for the position of White House doctor to represent the Navy, and I'd like to include you among the five nominees. And I said, I've never heard of that job. He goes, well, it's pretty quiet. It's been since the 1920s. We have a doctor from the Army, the Air Force, the Navy. There's a medical team up there. They travel on Air Force One. They take care of the president. And it's a two-year assignment. And at the end of that, you come back. You're still in the Navy. And we can assign you here, everywhere, any place you want to go. I said, I guess I have to live in Washington, right? He goes, well, yeah, absolutely. I said, well, let me call my husband. Hang up, call my husband his law firm. 
I blurt out right away that potentially there's a change of plans, told him all about it. And he goes, are you nuts? You, you hate Washington, D.C. You grew up there in the 60s. You know very well it's hot and humid in the summer. It's cold and miserable in the winter. But most important of all, they don't have good Mexican food like they do here in San Diego. It's about the good Mexican food. And he says, I thought you were getting out. I thought you were going to become a trophy wife. I said, oh, you're right, you're right. Let me tell him no. Hang up, get ready to call my boss. And my pager, in those old days, this old vibrating thing on your desk, it just says, call so-and-so. It was vibrating all of a sudden. It says, call me back. It was my husband. So I call him back. I said, what's up? I'm getting ready to call my boss. He said, you know, it dawned on me, you'll never get this job anyway, but it's a good resume item in case you work for Kaiser. I said, okay, so put your name in. Great, thanks for the faith. I'll go ahead and tell my boss. So fast forward, nine months later, I'm in Washington, D.C. It's the holidays, Christmas time. They're decorating the White House. It's beautiful. And I'm with the four other guys who've been nominated to fill the one position in the Navy to represent the Navy at the White House. And I'm looking at the competition, I'm checking them out, and I'm feeling really sick because they're beautiful. They're like nice hair, nice teeth, medals up to here. They look like Tom Cruise out of that movie, Top Gun, okay? <laughs> and so we get interviewed by the people from security because you have a top secret security clearance. We get mem interviewed by members of the medical unit, the doctors and nurses, the medics there. We get interviewed by there. And then the final interview privately for each of us was with the head physician at the White House, Dr. J. Burton Lee III. Well, back in those days, before Al Gore invented the internet, um, I did a literature search on Dr. J. Burton Lee III, because one of the things you have to remember, when you do an interview, you gotta check out who's gonna be interviewing you, because the hope is that you'll find some commonality, right? So I did a literature search on Dr. Lee, trying to find some way we, we have something in common. Well, guess what, we had nothing in common. He was, you know, New England blue bloods. He had a home in the Hamptons. He had gone to Andover with George Herbert Walker Bush. He was on first names basis with the President and First Lady. We had nothing in common. And I think the, the only Filipinos he saw were the guys in the White House mess where my people came from. So, so that's how I went in the interview. So we get interviewed, and so it's my time now to be interviewed on the ground floor of the White House by Dr. J. Burton Lee III. So Dr. Roberts, the incumbent physician, marches me in to the ground floor of the White House. He says, Connie, have a seat. I'm going to introduce you to Dr. Lee. So I sit down. The secretary's looking at me like, must be the token short woman, Asian American person they put here. Dr. Roberts goes over to the door, and I can hear the following exchange between the two. He says, Dr. Lee, I have our next candidate here. And a male voice on the other end goes, well, did you bring her binder with her paperwork and her resume? And Dr. Roberts goes, oh my goodness, I forgot in the other building. And then I hear something like a book or something thrown against the wall, and the voice goes really gruff. He goes, well, never mind, I'll make the assessment without it. And so Dr. Roberts pulls away from the door. He looks at me and goes, you're on. <laughs> You've just upset the guy I have to interview with. Thanks, buddy. So I stand up, take a deep breath. It's before Amy Cuddy wrote that book about power posing. Took a deep breath myself and I did something I believed in and what I did was I said a silent prayer I said dear God if this is meant to be show me a sign walked into the door through the doorway into that little office where Dr. Lee was and I saw Dr. Lee and he was about 64 years old at the time very distinguished handsome gentleman business suit but as soon as I saw him I saw the sign right away and what it was was a single tan band-aid right across his forehead and at that time, I was a mom of two little kids, and my mommy eyes said, my goodness, he's got a boo-boo on his forehead. <laughs> Maybe he's human. So he looks at me, shakes my hand, nice, firm handshake, good eye contact, and then he motions over to his desk and a seat beside him. He says, sit down, just like that, sit down. So I walk over, and I think, boy, they do things differently at this White House. This guy doesn't even warm up. So I wait for him to sit down. We sit opposite each other and he launches right into my interview first question why do you want this job and you will all be asked that question with every law firm every every medical group you join every occupation you you seek every graduate group you wish to join any institution will ask you any job you're applying why do you want this job and I had prepared all these nice responses I thought politically correct for him but you know what, because I saw the sign, I wasn't gonna get the job anyway, this is what I said. Dr. Lee, it's payback time. 
And he looks at me like, what? I said, it's payback time. I owe a lot to the United States of America. My father was a poor Filipino man. He grew up in poverty. He joined the US Navy in the 1940s when the United States and the Philippines had an agreement. And he joined as an enlisted man, became an American citizen. I was born on a Navy base. I was educated in public school. I went to the military medical school. I got my MD, I got my career. I owe so much to this country. If I can repay my debt by serving the commander in chief, that's what I wanna do. So I look at Dr. Lee, there's no expression on his face. As we say in medicine, a flat affect. As they say in Vegas, poker face. <laughs> Next question, he looks at me, what can you do here? Once again, you're gonna be asked, what can you do in graduate school? What can you do for our medical group? What can you do in this company? What can you do here? I said, Dr. Lee, you see the three gold stripes on my sleeve? I was a commander. The longer I'm in the Navy, the more stripes they put on my sleeve, the more they put me behind a desk. I am not a desk doctor, I'm a trench doctor. You put me anywhere in the world outside of a medical center, I can take care of people. Once again, no expression on the man's face, poker face, flat affect. At this point, I'm feeling really bad because this is like the worst interview of my life. It's not feedback. So he stands up right in the middle of my interview. And so I stood up and he looks at me and says, as far as I'm concerned, we can stop the process right now. And I thought, oh my gosh, this is so embarrassing. I totally blew this. He said, I don't care who we're interviewing today or tomorrow, you've got the job. Thank you. And the way that fate would have it, 13 months later, I had his job. So. <laughs> that interview changed the trajectory of my life, as any interview will change the trajectory of yours. I wouldn't be on this stage today had I not had that interview. That one event taught me the following lessons, which I'm going to pass on to you today. The first one to me, really, is something separate from education and it's about your life partner. You make sure your life partner, your spouse, is your biggest fan of all the decisions you will make. You make sure that person has your back, supports you, your true friends. Your life partner is someone who elevates you, who wants only the best for you. So choose them and choose your friends wisely. Second is be open to opportunity. It may not be what you plan, but it may be better than what you imagine, so be open to that. Third, don't underestimate the power of prayer to guide you in your career and your life decisions. Fourth, honor and speak with your true authentic voice. Someone once asked me, it was one of the Medical school kids ask me, how do I know I'm speaking with a true, true authentic voice? And what I said was this, when you no longer have to pretend, that's how you know your true authentic voice. And finally, so I can be short and sweet, be grateful. Be grateful for all the blessings you have and all the talent you've received and all the things you're gonna do in your life. Be forever grateful. And finally, it is with gratitude that I end my speech today. I thank you for the honor of celebrating you, and I wish you tremendous success enjoying your career and in the years ahead. God bless you all.